This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by IBM. Big data at the speed of business. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and thank you for joining me for another two hours of Straight Talk Radio. I want to welcome members of our military who are tuning in over the Internet, and also new listeners in Silicon Valley, Chicago, and Boston. Thank you for being with us. In just a moment, former CEO of Pepsi-Cola and Apple Computer and lifelong entrepreneur, Mr. John Scully, will be joining us to talk about the transformative technologies which are going to shake up the way we live and work the same way the Internet, personal computers, and mobile phones did. And we're going to find out what companies can do to adapt faster and more nimbly. But before Mr. Scully joins us, as is my custom each week, let me tell you a little about his background. John Scully III was born in New York City and spent his childhood between his mother's native country, Bermuda, and New York. He earned his undergraduate degree from Brown University and his MBA from Wharton. Scully joined Pepsi-Cola as a trainee in 1967. Three years later, he became the company's youngest vice president of marketing. Determined to dethrone Coca-Cola, Scully launched an all-out assault, which included the landmark Pepsi Generation ad campaign, the first move to plastic soda bottles and larger economy sizes, the Pepsi Challenge taste test, in-home product testing, and other innovations. Then 10 years later, after he joined Pepsi... He was named the youngest president and CEO in the company's history. But by 83, Scully was ready to take on a new challenge. On the invitation of founder Steve Jobs, Scully became CEO of Apple Computer. And annual revenue soared from $800 million to $8 billion under his direction. But as differences between Jobs and Scully escalated, Jobs exited the company. And by 1993, Scully was tendering his resignation. From here, Scully parlayed his experience at Pepsi-Cola and Apple by starting the venture capital firm of Scully Brothers with siblings Arthur and David. Their list of successful startups is long and impressive. But in recent years, Scully has turned his attention to healthcare and mobile technology markets, and we'll hear more about that later in today's program. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report a business icon who says, adapt fast or face extinction, Mr. John Scully. Welcome to the program, Mr. Scully. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Nice to be with you. Now, first of all, congratulations on the success of your book, Moonshot, which is a must-read for any business that wants to capitalize on on advice you've charged companies a lot of money for. <laughs> I, I thought uh, maybe we could start today's program with having you explain what a moonshot is and, and why they're important. Sure. Well, moonshot is a well-understood metaphor in Silicon Valley, and it really traces back to the inspiring mission that President John F. Kennedy gave the nation in the 1960s when he said, we're going to put a man on the moon and return him safely within the decade, and we did in 1969. And that, of course, created the foundation technologies for what we know today is everything digital since we moved from analog technology, which couldn't possibly have fit into a rocket to get all the way to the moon and wasn't accurate enough, even if it could, to be able to do the kind of telemetry navigation that it required for a moon mission. So a moonshot more recently would be Let's say when Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web and made the Internet accessible for non-technical people, or when Google created a way to search content on the web, and we had an entirely new concept of how we could access information, or Steve Jobs creating the iPhone, and it changed everything. It's now the cultural instrument of our era. So these are moonshots, which means that for the moonshot, the world is very different after the moonshot. And there are only a small number of uh, technology innovations that I guess could be called moonshot. And I decided to write my book, Moonshot, because I think we are in an exceptional time. In the many decades that I've been in business, I've never quite seen anything that is comparable to the exponential growth of several technologies that reinforce one another. For example, uh, we all know about cloud computing, and yet 10 years ago, very few of us did. Mobility, ever since 2007 with smartphones, with the iPhone, uh, that has changed the way in which we do most things in our life today. But most importantly, the 
unstructured data analytics, which is now possible, means that we have ways to completely change the customer experience of all kinds of products and services, and that same unstructured data analytics going over high-speed telecommunications means that we can look forward to what is being called the digitization of work, and that is uh, linked with a new era known as the Internet of Things, and the Internet of Things means that sensors are going to be built into just about everything. When I joined Silicon Valley back in the early 80s, it was in the early days of the microprocessor, and we've seen with Moore's Law how that has changed the world decade after decade. But sensors are a, a miniaturized little tiny devices that are able to capture everything from heat to sound to uh, pulses in uh, measuring various biometrics on a human being to being able to track light, being able to track uh, almost everything. For example, inside your smartphone, there are probably at least 10 or 12 sensors. Uh, inside of a jet engine on an aircraft today, probably 200 sensors, which are tracking the performance of an engine as it's flying over the ocean in terms of its fuel consumption and the safety of the passengers on board. So these little sensors are communicating not to people, but they're commuting machine, uh, communicating machine to machine. And then we're getting into a new era of technology, which is called deep learning or machine learning. And these things are going to dramatically change our world. And that's what I write about is what is the impact of all of these technologies? Because it can be pretty confusing if you just look at them as technologies. It becomes pretty clear as you look at the impact of what it means. And that's what I expose and try to unpack for the reader, particularly entrepreneurs in my book, Moonshot. Yeah, let me ask you, though, don't they, aren't these moonshots a bit risky? I mean, when you set out to do something truly innovative, something that's going to disrupt life and work as we know it, the opportunity for failure is enormous. So how does a company uh, that's risk-adverse get around that? Well, if a company is too risk-adverse, they may well uh, find themselves left out of it. Uh, because what, what is happening with these, the moonshot is one big major impact regardless of which of these technologies we're talking about. And that big impact is that we're seeing a market power shift from large incumbent companies that have traditionally had major franchises in industry after industry around the world. And now customers, because businesses are only as valuable as their customers, customers are more influenced by the opinions of other customers than they are by the traditional messages of these incumbent companies. And that has pervasive impact on everything as we look forward into the future. Every industry, every uh, product or service category is exposed to change because customers, if they like something, they're going to tell others about it. And because of the viral effect of these wireless technologies and data analytics and uh, the ability to use the cloud in a reliable, efficient way, it enables us to get the message out very rapidly what customers' opinions are. And we're seeing entirely new companies uh, redefining industries. And there are many examples that I give in, in the book Moonshot. But importantly, I have many conversations, many stories uh, that I was able to capture with uh, entrepreneurs I know and, and others I wanted to meet, went out and uh, found out how to get a hold of them. And so this is a book about uh, what successful entrepreneurs learned along the way and most importantly, because you talked about risk-taking, uh, in our culture, we give permission to fail. There's really no other culture in the world that gives permission to fail. In other cultures, people will say, well, gosh, you failed, so why should I work with you again? In our culture, our first reaction is, that's interesting, so what did you learn? <laughs> that cultural advantage that we have, which means that you can actually exploit failure. Failure can actually become a resource. Well, that's a very good point, and we're going to talk about that when we come back from our first break. And when we do come back, we're going to find out where the next moonshots are likely to appear. You're listening to the Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. 
Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. Tableau is a drag-and-drop software product people of any skill level can use to analyze data. It's a self-service business analytics application that helps you answer questions with data. You can connect to any data in virtually any format and visualize it on the fly. Databases, spreadsheets, and even big data sources are easily combined into charts, graphs, visualizations, reports, and dashboards. People can analyze data, drag and drop, at 10 times the speed of a traditional business intelligence system. The most impressive thing about Tableau is that people of all skill levels can use it. In fact, you can get a free 14-day trial off of our website. What is your data trying to tell you? For your free 14-day trial, visit Tableau at T-A-B-L-E-A-U dot com slash Costa. Hi, this is Erica Fisher. I'm a certified personal trainer at the world-famous Chaminade Resort right here in Santa Cruz. I've got some good news for you. Right now, I will award to the first five people who call me a free introductory personal training session at the ultra-luxurious state-of-the-art fitness center right here at the Chaminade in Santa Cruz. This personal training session will include a personal assessment, setting goals, and an introduction to using the equipment customized to meet your special situation. So call me right now at 831-588-7090. And if you're lucky enough to be one of the first five callers, I will be seeing you at the Chaminade Fitness Center for a one-on-one free appointment. 831-588-7098. Call now, 831-588-7098, ericafitness.com. Are you ready for this? Flight 1080 is looking for new members to join the team. You guys, I really don't want you to miss out on this opportunity. I need people in Hollister, San Jose, Gilroy, Watsonville, Salinas, and Monterey. All new teammates will receive free training and upline support. Go first class and enroll with the CEO pack and get free sales materials and attend VIP meetings. For a limited time, I'll include free business cards. That's right, free business cards for all new CEOs to help you get started. You don't want to miss out on this offer. If you have free access to a church hall or any other meeting place in these areas, contact me at 831-218-5726 or DM at KSEO.com. This is a golden opportunity for bilingual people too. Hollister, San Jose, Gilroy, Watsonville, Salinas, Monterey, and surrounding areas. Let's work smarter. Let's work together. To sign up by phone, call 831-218-5726. To join online, go to DaveMichaels.Youngevity.com. You'll find information in both English and Spanish. That's DaveMichaels.Youngevity.com or call 831-218-5726. That's 218-5726. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is former CEO of Pepsi-Cola and Apple Computer and legendary entrepreneur, Mr. John Scully. And before the break, you were talking about the culture in the United States, which tolerates failure, uh, which isn't true elsewhere. So in your view, has been, has this been responsible for the large number of moonshots which have come out of the U.S.? Absolutely. I mean, we see uh, highly educated people in other parts of the world uh, a number of them come to Silicon Valley and end up taking on major senior-level positions. And yet I remember giving a speech in India some years ago in Mumbai, and the question came from the audience, well, we have all of these highly trained Indian engineers who have been so successful in Silicon Valley, and they come back to India. Why is it we haven't created a Facebook or a Google or, or an Apple? And I think the answer is not that you lack talent, it's that you lack a culture that 
is open to people experimenting, trying something. If it doesn't work, you don't get punished. So if you think back to the big success stories, uh, even the most successful companies are exposed of becoming victims of their own success. I mean, how is it that Intel and Microsoft, two great companies, very talented people work in those companies, and they dominated the personal computer industry during the 1990s, during the early days of the World Wide Web, yet both of those companies missed the era of mobility. And you say, how is that possible? And I think it was possible because they became victims of their success. It was new companies where entrepreneurs were questioning, well, isn't there a better way to do things? And mobility was an entirely new industry, and it was one that you would think would have been at the advantage of the incumbents to be able to scale into it, and yet there were new entrants who ended up defining this mobile era that we live in today. And this will probably happen again, and it's because we give permission to fail, and the only reason that small companies are uh, so successful is because they do things that big companies just can't maneuver fast enough to do. Big companies Isn't this, but let me ask you this, isn't this normal for a company? I mean, we're Pavlovian by nature. If you do something that's successful, then you want to repeat it. And so as you get larger, you continue to repeat the thing that you get goodies for. You get dopamine in your brain for succeeding. So you, you, you eventually those behaviors inside a company become institutionalized. And it's very hard to change a corporate DNA, isn't it? You're absolutely right, and that's a great observation. And think of it this way. Uh, the one thing that all big organizations have in common is that they empower the middle managers with the authority to say no. And rarely does anyone have on their own in big organizations the authority to say yes. You have to go through a series of protocols and meetings and commitment committees and things of this sort. So it, it's really bureaucratic to get a yes in a big organization. And it's really easy to get a no. And that's a very simplified way of thinking about why is it that young, new, small companies that carry no baggage uh, are able to start with a clean sheet of paper and say, gee, I wonder if there's a better way to do things. And what I describe in Moonshot is that you start with the customer. Because of this era where the customer is in power, where the customer opinion counts so much, you want to solve a customer problem. So the big opportunity that I talk about is the business plan is really obsolete as a strategic idea. The business plan is for budgeting purposes. The customer plan is what defines the breakout opportunity of can a customer focus business, attract new customers, retain those customers, monetize those customers, satisfy those customers in some unique way. It's all about the customer plan. So you and I come from a time when we used to, do you remember writing up uh, three and five year business plans? It's inconceivable to people these days that we would do that. It, it really is. And, and here's <laughs> what, what uh, really amazed me is that look at all the work that was put into writing, even the annual business plan, which could take months to write it. And it might be a 70 or 80 page document. Absolutely. And then, and then the next year uh, you do a summary of what happened the previous year and you do it in about a page. And I used to think, well, why is it that when you look backwards, you can write in one page what happened, and yet when you look forward, you have to write 70 pages and spend months doing it? And the answer is that you have a different perspective when you're looking back than you do looking forward. And so you've got to learn how to look forward, and that's a lot about what I talk about. Something I learned working with Steve Jobs called Zooming. It was what Steve called it. It was called Zoom Out, Connect the Dots, uh, find different domains that may not have anything uh, obvious in common, but Steve was brilliant, and he would find ways to see things that other people didn't see, and he'd connect the dots, and then he'd say, okay, now you zoom in, and you simplify, and you focus on the customer experience. And he did that over and over again, and it's one of the great lessons that I think all of us can take advantage of and learn about. But it, but interestingly enough, um there were times when even Apple Computer was not very risk tolerant. <laughs> we have to remember they went through phases where they they were very dictatorial at moments, and then other times things opened up a little bit for them. Oh, that's true. Uh, and you know it'll it'll happen 
to even some great new companies. I mean, it's just it's bound to happen. It's kind of human nature, and and you uh, you articulated that really well. So uh, it's it's part of the law of large numbers that that uh, the bigger organizations get, the less tolerant they are to experiment and try new things. I mean, right. even in our culture in the U.S., which is more tolerant than perhaps any other in the world, you know, even we find that our big companies suffer from becoming victims of their own success. Although recently, I have to tell you, I met one of the vice presidents at Coca-Cola, and uh, he claimed that uh, the consumer's tolerance for failure is actually a little bit higher than we might think. Uh, and he happened to mention that Coca-Cola first tried to sell their flavored uh, vitamin water in a can like their other beverages, <laughs> and yeah. the consumers hated water in a can. Uh, they were complaining it wasn't carbonated. They expected it to be carbonated. They had certain expectations with things that were uh, uh, that uh, were delivered to them in a can. So uh, Coca-Cola went back to the drawing board, and they came out with, a, with clear plastic bottles with, you know, very clear water that we can see today. So can a company uh, reverse a, a risk that fails? Absolutely, and, and uh, I described... Uh people who do that well as adaptive innovators. So we don't all have to be Larry Page, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, uh, but we can be you know, part of this entrepreneurial, try new things, take risks, make mistakes, take advantage of these exponential growth technologies we were talking about earlier. And what you really need is the curiosity and the willingness to experiment and adapt. It's all about not just pure innovation and invention, it's about adaptive innovation. If you think back to uh, what Darwin really talked about with evolution, it wasn't just the survival of the fittest, it was the survival of those species that were able to adapt to a changing environment. And it's no different for us as we look at building businesses. Well, it's interesting that you bring that up. I think in the second hour I'm going to talk about that. I am a trained evolutionary biologist. And so when I look at businesses, I am always looking at a continuum of adapting uh, that you can never really stop because uh, if you do stop, the environment's bound to change and uh, you're going to ba- become one of the 99% of the species on the earth that uh, no longer exist. They were simply were not able to uh, adapt efficiently. Now we're going to take another break and when we come back, we will hear more from John Scully. You're listening to the Costa Report. In the opening of All Quiet on the Western Front, Eric Maria Remark wrote, This book is to be neither an accusation nor a confession, and least of all, an adventure. For death is not an adventure to those who stand face to face with it. It will simply try to tell of a generation of men who, even though they may have escaped its shells, were destroyed by the war. Today, Project Healing Waters offers men and women that have escaped the shells of war the opportunity to heal by teaching our returning veterans to fly fish in some of the most beautiful, tranquil rivers in our country. These natural surroundings have the ability to restore the human spirit, and with your help, Project Healing Waters is able to reach out to thousands of our men and women in the military every year. For information on how you can help, go to projecthealingwaters.org. Please give and give generously to those who have put their lives on the line for you. That's projecthealingwaters.org. Help those who have escaped the shells of war and need your help to come all the way back. Imagine a medical system that offers the range of care you want with the electronic communication you need. Physicians Medical Group of Santa Cruz is that care provider. With hundreds of independent doctors sharing information with each other, labs, hospitals, and pharmacies electronically, your PMG physician is looking at real-time data about your real-time care needs. Visit pmgscc.com. Prices are for base buildings only and may not be available in some areas. 
This is an alert. If your business or church is building this year, you're about to pay more than you should. This could mean thousands of dollars more for your office, retail space, church, or warehouse. So call General Steel now for the quality and the price in a pre-engineered steel building that you just can't beat. That's right. General Steel can save you thousands of dollars with a pre-engineered steel building designed for your business or church. How much can you save? How about a 50 by 100 foot building for under $35,000? So don't pay thousands more than you should without calling General Steel first. Call 898-STEEL today and save as much as half the cost and time of conventional construction. Don't let rising steel prices put your project in jeopardy. Call now to lock in your price for three months. Call 800-98-STEEL. That's 800-98-STEEL. Don't spend thousands more than you should. Call 800-987-8335. Hi, I'm George Norrie from Coast to Coast AM. KSCO is one of my favorite stations because it's all about being independent. And that's why I'm intrigued by the novel and creative way that MZ has managed to keep KSCO going and growing in an age when most advertising revenue-dependent companies are going out of business. It's called Longevity, an essential life sciences company with a simple message. 90 for life, which means take all 90 nutrients the body needs to maintain health and live longer. The Longevity business opportunity may be the ideal home-based business for you because it's a good business that helps others It costs very little to get going, and all the training and support is available to you for free. I encourage you to attend the free business meetings that Dave Michaels puts on at KSCO Studios each Monday evening at 7.15, just after he lands Flight 1080. Go online at kscoteam.com to check out the business. That's kscoteam.com. Join me for It's a Question of Balance with Ruth Copland on Saturday evenings 8 till 10. In the first hour, we ask questions that matter, focusing on the deeper issues underlying current events, politics and our daily lives. Call in and join the conversation. In the second hour, we balance the intellectual with the creative by featuring in-depth interviews with local, national and international guests from the arts. Tune in Saturday evenings 8 to 10 and discover It's a Question of Balance. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is John Scully. As I mentioned uh, in the opening, Mr. Scully, your company, Scully & Brothers, invests and works with a number of innovative companies, so you have to stay on the bleeding edge of innovation. Uh, And you mentioned sensors, but where else do you think we're going to see the most transformation? Well, I think we're going to see the transformation uh, in what's called the infrastructure as a service. If you think back in Silicon Valley in the early parts of the 21st century, a lot of the venture capital investment went into new technologies, and we're benefiting from those investments as huge industries have emerged with cloud and mobility and data analytics and things of that sort. But what we're seeing now is that new infrastructure is being created, redefining industries that uses technology but aren't necessarily technology companies per se. An example of that would be Uber. Uber is less than five years old. It's valued at $45 billion. Uh, It uses technology to enable drivers in black cars to be able to simplify and deliver a much higher customer experience than was possible by trying to hail a taxi when it's raining out in San Francisco or in Santa Cruz. And so uh, infrastructure as a service, whether it's uh, Airbnb or whether it's some of these courier services that say they're going to Uh, enable you to order something on e-commerce and get it delivered to your home within an hour. These are infrastructure as a service. They're using technology. They aren't technology companies per se. And that's a huge opportunity. And we're seeing every industry is going to be open to that kind of change. And McKinsey and Company calls it the digitization of work. And we've seen large corporations like Cisco and Intel and GE have said that they're actually betting their future on the digitization of work, and that's a lot of uh, what we see with the uh, reintroduction of manufacturing back to the U.S. using uh, these new technologies, and by the way, using a lot of sensors and robotics as well. Well, that is quite a change because in the past, uh, service companies have had a very difficult time getting capitalization. That's right, and now we're seeing that 
suddenly, if you rethink what is a service company as a disruptor that can dramatically change the entire industry, like the taxi industry uh, was an industry of about $140 billion in San Francisco. Well, since Uber was introduced, uh, Uber's revenue alone in San Francisco was almost $500 million. And so you not only can replace something that was done before or expand the market that was there before, but you can do it in a very innovative way. And infrastructure as a service is a big opportunity. But let me tr take you in, in even a different direction to show you how, how wide the opportunity is. You mentioned earlier that you're an evolutionary biologist by training. Yes. And nothing is more interesting to me than the opportunities to reinvent medicine as we've known it. Uh, it's called precision medicine. And what it means is that we're now able to think about using big data analytics, uh, using uh, the human genome sequencing, which companies like Illumina have gotten down to 37 hours. Uh, there are people who are now working on um, getting that down to less than a minute, uh, getting the cost down from $1,000 a person to sequence a human genome down to uh, less than $100, and it'll go much lower than that. And then you start to think about sensors and being able to embed miniaturized sensors uh, inside a human and being able to track, for example, the genomics, uh, the number of genes. As you know, we have about 26,000 genes. We have yes. two million proteins and the ability to monitor a protein. So, for example, take ferritin, which is an iron protein. That protein is off. You can create a customized, personalized um, medication for an individual and we're already seeing, when you look what's happening with some of the stem cell uh, research that's going on to be able to use transduction to take uh, white blood cells and then be able to uh, then convert that into what are called cancer-killing T cells and using both uh, stem cell therapy and using uh, cancer-killing T cells, we're seeing entirely new approaches to medicine. And all of this is being enabled by many of these same technologies I was talking about earlier, cloud sensors, big data analytics. Well, it's interesting, you know, big data analytics is really leading to predictive analytics, which in turn is creating this field of predictive medicine, if you will. Uh, when you look at the breakthroughs that we've had in genomic sciences and now new sensor technology, and then we haven't even begun, you and I haven't even begun talking about nanobots, which are now being miniaturized to the size of a human cell. I mean, when nanobots can be programmed to eliminate uh, pre-Alzheimer's plaques and cancer cells, medicine will be, you know, diseases will be treated from inside the body. Uh, and and I, I would venture to say that, that this idea that we're I invading the body from the outside in is going to look pretty prehistoric. Well, uh, that's, that's such a great uh, uh introduction to a field. We could spend the whole show just talking about that. I think it's so interesting what's going on with the use of predictive analytics and being able to look at things from cell addressable model, uh, model clonal antibodies to uh, being able to, you know, as you say, actually go in and think about medicine at the molecular level. Uh, Absolutely. We're going to look back at, at uh, medicine um, 50 years from now and say, what were we doing with chemotherapy and radiation? Oh, well, the idea that we were lopping off body parts to cure people, if that isn't going to look savage, I don't know what is. <laughs> it, it's going to look pretty bad. Uh, but, but, you know, when you're an evolutionary biologist, you're looking at the long haul of human history. And uh, it really is a humbling experience to know that a million years from now, you know, we are the Neanderthals. Uh, so, so I, I, I never, yeah, I, I never have to worry about getting too arrogant about technology. Um, but I, I do want to bring up one other thing. Uh, last year, you also launched a low cost smartphone. Yes, um, we, we uh, have just started that. And it's a Silicon Valley design a smartphone. Uh, it's it's not really designed to compete against Apple or high-end Samsung or any product like that. In fact, it's not even intended for the United States. It's for the emerging markets. And the reason is that we're in an era of commoditization of the technologies that go into smartphones. And it is now totally practical to build a very high-quality smartphone, 4G smartphone, uh, that you can sell for under $150. And we are doing that, but our differentiation, because, by the way, there are literally hundreds of 
uh, Chinese factories that are working on products exactly like this. So someone would say, well, why in the world would you go into that business? Well, I'm glad you was, brought that out. I was going to ask you, are you late to this market? Uh, and and why why not uh, introduce it in the U.S.? Well, well, first of all, I, th- I think we uh, we probably wouldn't be successful in the, in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't need this. But in the emerging markets where you have uh, almost 40, 50 percent of the population is, is under 30 years of age. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these people have a different buying habit than we do. They, the, they, they don't have personal computers. They have smartphones. They have tablets. And they buy them more than one time a year. And so there's a real opportunity to bring to them uh, the products that are designed with the care and attention to fit and finish. And, and uh, remember, this is fashion electronics. Uh, so we are trying to say, can we bring Silicon Valley design into the emerging markets and give them something at price points that they can afford? They might uh, look for, for a product like an Apple iPhone. I mean, that's what I use, an iPhone 6, but it's just out of their price range. And so the emerging markets are we believe still an opportunity. No guarantees of success, as I told you, but uh, we're, we have a first-class team working on it, and uh, we're enthusiastic about the early results. So you're marrying uh, portability of the phone with fashion, so to speak, and at a lower price point. Uh, and, and it was very interesting that you chose the Chinese and Singapore market, and then I believe, if I have this right, you plan to expand into Africa, South America, and Eastern Europe uh, as well. Now, uh, we're going to have to get ready to take another break, uh, but I, I have to tell you, I was absolutely fascinated by this cell phone because I'm not, I, I understand why you didn't inter- introduce it into the United States. Uh, I, I immediately understood why that wasn't the case. The markets overseas are larger and uh, and also um, there is a, a, a more uh, receptive market in the I think overseas uh, and they are looking for less expensive products as well uh, but uh, I do I, I do think there's probably a market here I don't think everybody can afford a, an Apple iPhone but uh, we're going to take another break stay right where you are we'll be right back with more from John Scully you're listening to the Costa Report. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli of Caraccioli Cellars, and I have a question for you, Scott. What goes into making Method Champenois Bubble? You know, it's a process that's really defined by the French government that we've taken and enacted into our wines, which really drive the quality of our sparkling project. So this is a process that the French government defines pretty specifically, and you remain faithful to that. Yeah, 100%, and in some places we push it a little bit. Now, how do the bubbles translate on the palate? You know, it really gives you that vehicle, that mousse for the character of the sparkling wine, carrying the fruit and the complexity. It's the expression of the wine. To find out more about Caraccioli Wines, visit us at www.caracciolicellars.com or stop by our tasting room in downtown Carmel, California. That's Caraccioli Cellars, C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I. Cellars, come taste the difference. If you listen to the news today, you might come away with the impression that our biggest challenges are political and economic. But if this were true, then countries which have different political and economic systems would be facing different problems. But they aren't. Every government and every nation is struggling with job creation, debt, immigration, climate change, terrorism, health care, energy, and wild swings in financial markets. So something else must be going on. That's why I'm inviting you to get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, a book which shows how the Roman, Mayan, and Khmer empires once faced similar challenges and what we can do to avoid their fate. Visit RebeccaCosta.com today and get a copy of The Watchman's Rattle, because once you do, you'll never look at the world the same way. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, 
it may change your life. Lecithin is an active ingredient in bile, the body's soap or detergent that's charged with the role of dissolving fatty substances from foods so that the rest of the body can have access to them. Lecithin can also help the body absorb minerals like calcium and magnesium. And because it's so readily available as a dietary supplement, and it's really inexpensive, it's a cheap way to support health and wellness. Because lecithin is found throughout nature, there's lots of foods you can use to give yourself a lecithin bump. You can get lecithin in organ meat, seeds, and butter. Eggs are nature's richest source because cholesterol is also dissolved in bile. Lecithin can protect you from gallstones too. Gallstones can result from poorly dissolved or crystallized cholesterol. Under ordinary and healthy circumstances, cholesterol stays in the bile. However, if our cells are making too much cholesterol, it can precipitate out in crystals and form little rocks or stones, so-called gallstones, which can clog up the tiny tubes in the gallbladder. If this sounds familiar, the last thing you want to do is what half a million people do every year, and that's have your gallbladder removed. If you have a history of gallstone formation, you want to make sure you're using lecithin especially with fatty meals. Aside from the aforementioned food sources, you can get lecithin as a liquid or in capsules. It's also available as a powder that you can blend into a protein drink. It tastes great, and it'll give your smoothie a nice, smooth, creamy texture, too. Pharmacist Ben here, urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos, too, at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Rebecca Costa, and my guest today is John Scully. And uh, before we move on, uh, do you mind if I ask you, how were you able to drop the price so substantially on the, on the mobile device that you introduced in China and Singapore? Well, the way we were able to do that is we already own a billion-dollar supply chain uh, company in Singapore that covers Southeast Asia and India, and we were able to take advantage of our credit financing uh, skills. We already had an infrastructure that we could leverage uh, other resources from. So it, we could come in at a price point that and make money that other companies just couldn't do because they – uh, had to carry so much infrastructure. If you look at the large companies who had already dominated the smartphone world in the emerging markets, yes. uh, companies like HTC and Nokia and others, uh, they were starting to lose money. And we realized that um, if you invest in R&D and if you invest in um, big overhead, you can't make money at these price points. But we didn't have big overhead because we had another business we could leverage off of. And so we had a uh, very uh, light overhead. We did not invest in R&D. We went to uh, large uh, manufacturers who already had the skills, uh, had already been building products for other companies, and we could basically reskin those products and add our software on top of Android, and it gave us the ability to uh, have a very low-cost model to come out with very, very high-quality phones. Well, that answers that question. <laughs> uh, so, uh, it, during the break, uh, one of our engineers came up and said, listen, do I have to go to China to get one of these? And I said, probably so. Uh, and he said, well, how were they able to do it? And I said, well, uh, Mr. Scully's a sharp guy. And uh, if there's a way to enter a market, uh, a mature market, and uh, bring about change, uh, he's probably the right steward to do it. Uh, now, you have made the, made the point that uh, moonshots are often the result of a higher pursuit, which then later becomes uh, commercially viable and profitable. So from this perspective, the, the people that are responsible for the moonshot, they seem to be driven by something larger than money. What do you think? They're driven by a noble cause. And I learned this when I came from the soft drink industry, where we were driven by trying to beat our competitor. Uh, we didn't know what a noble cause was. And then I, so I got to know Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and we would sit around in the evenings and talk about the, where they saw the personal computer industry going. And they never talked about how much money they were going to make. They always talked about the, how they were going to change the world. And the one thing they 
agreed on without any question was that the world was going to see an entirely new generation of computers that would be incredibly personal, focused on the knowledge worker that Peter Drucker had defined a decade earlier, and give them tools. So Steve Jobs called them tools for the mind. And while they agreed on the noble cause, they had completely different strategies. Uh, Bill Gates was all about creating a platform that would uh, reach out to anybody who wanted to build a personal computer, and they'd pay them back a licensing fee for the software. And Steve Jobs said, absolutely no. He said, I need to control everything, the hardware, the software, the design, and it has to be proprietary in every way. And Steve Jobs uh, was right whenever there was innovation that required uh, a real breakthrough, and Bill Gates was right when it meant uh, expanding out and taking advantage of that innovation to a broader market. And we're seeing that all over again with Google and Apple. So is that where moonshots originate? Do they originate from a noble cause? I think the big ones do. They really do. Um, and that's why I think you see that uh, people like Elon Musk are talking about, um, take the electric car. I mean, imagine if Elon Musk had tried to do this in partnership with one of the big auto manufacturers in Detroit. I mean, it sure wouldn't look like the Tesla. <laughs> it sure wouldn't uh, um, be, I think, as, as beautiful a design as it's turned out to be. And the irony is that uh, Tesla has about ha- half the market cap uh, value of General Motors, and it's just a young company. So innovation does get its rewards, uh, and it does take the uh, genius innovators uh, to define a major new era, but there's an opportunity for the rest of us, the adaptive innovators, to be able to learn the lessons from that. And that's what I tried to uh, write about in Moonshot. Moonshot is not an autobiography. Moonshot is uh, the lessons learned by me and by many others, the entrepreneurs I work with, Um, many I just know and respect, that what is it that we learn that can be generalized and applied by other people who want to be entrepreneurs who want to build their own breakthrough companies and be adaptive innovators? So uh, I felt that when I go to business schools, Rebecca, they are talking about case histories of experiences that senior executives have in large organizations. And yet I see so many young entrepreneurs skip over business school because (laughs) – The schools don't teach them the things they need to know. How do you raise capital? How do you recruit the team to believe in what you believe in? How do you get proof of concept? How do you go from proof of concept to expansion? You know, how do you deal about a crisis? We all have them if you're taking risks and your back is against the wall. And how do you pivot, come out of it alive? And these are the types of things that entrepreneurs shared with me, their experiences and what we tried to put into some principles that could be useful to other people who want to build their own companies in the future. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because when we talk about a noble cause and we talk about how the Steve Jobs or or how Google came about, um, and, and we look at the origins of these moonshots and these disruptive and, and uh, really sea changes, if you will, that occur, um, is there anything that governments can do to encourage or discourage that kind of risk taking or, or or going after moonshots. I mean, if Obama called you into the Oval Office tomorrow, what would it, what advice would you give him to spur innovation? Here's what I would tell him: I, I would say, Mr. President, uh, the all the jobs in the U.S. are created by small and medium sized companies. So when the government gives you statistics on job creation, uh, some people may think that government's creating jobs. They don't. Uh, They're actually uh, eliminating jobs in the government. They may think big companies create jobs. They actually don't. They're eliminating jobs as well. All of the job creation is coming from small and medium business. And I would say, Mr. President, we need to think about how do we create a clearer runway for entrepreneurs to prosper because their prosperity is going to be translated into the prosperity growth of the country. And that means that government should focus on how do we educate people. So I think, frankly, uh, a good idea of extending more free education in community colleges uh, does make sense. So it opens it up for more people to get education beyond the high school level. On the other hand, I think government needs to get out of the way and reduce a lot of the obstacles that entrepreneurs have when they try to start companies. And so uh, I think the challenge that people in government have is that 
they don't realize that large organizations, and it doesn't make any difference whether it's free enterprise organizations or government organizations, large organizations have built-in barriers to want to change, built-in barriers to want to innovate. And so you're not going to have innovation in the government. You're going to have innovation with entrepreneurs. And government ought to say, what can I do to help, not uh, what can I do as a government? My, uh, ourselves to be innovative. Well, I think there's probably a lot of listeners that are nodding their head up and down right now. If I know our listeners, they'll be emailing me and saying, have John Scully come back again. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time for this hour. But uh, before we say goodbye, I want to thank you uh, for your wonderful book, Moonshot, and also ma- taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you, Mr. Scully. Thank you, Rebecca. Nice to be with you. And you can get Moonshot at Amazon. We have audio books. We have e-books and hardcover books. And thanks a lot for letting me come and talk about it. Absolutely. Come back soon. If your station is leaving us after this hour and you have a question or a comment to make about our interview with John Scully, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop me a note on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. We're all over the Internet. And if you joined our broadcast late or missed the interview with John Scully and you want to listen to what uh, previous guests had to say, remember you can always download episodes of the Costa Report from our website, Apple iTunes, Podbean, and our YouTube channel. And you'll also find our weekly radio blog posted every week on our webpage. The blog captures the headline news from every interview, so if you ever have to miss a program, and I hope you won't, you can still read the blog. It's short, to the point, and guaranteed to make you feel a whole lot smarter. My guest next week is former senator from Texas, Phil Graham, who says Clinton found a way to work with the Republican Congress, and Ronald Reagan never let partisan crossfire stop him. Find out why Graham says Washington is on the move again. Don't miss Senator Phil Graham next week on the only weekly news program that puts policy ahead of politics. Now stay tuned for a second hour of Straight Talk Radio. You're listening to the Costa Report. 